So a very, very warm, and it is quite warm today, <laughs> welcome to um, the wonderful Rebecca Aston, and I have to say Hertfordshire, because she's been coming so long to class that, you know, I don't know if people are watching this, if you're aware of the way that we run the rest repair classes, but we always like to have where people are in their, in their Zoom screen, so people can make connections. And so... For over three years now, I've been saying Rebecca Aston Hertfordshire. Now, Rebecca, you're you're here, and your name is Luke, but I know that's not your name. But I uh, yes, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Sarah Glynn was there as Mrs. Christmas at one point on one of my interviews. That was quite funny. So Rebecca has been with the Rest Repair Recover family. Mm-hmm. I'm going to call it because we do get to know each other really well um, for a very long time, and has done what I'm going to call sort of the absolutely perfect example of a slow, gentle, no silver bullet seeking recovery. Um, I've seen Rebecca absolutely at her worst and I only got to meet her recently when she came on retreat. Um, And for many months, Rebecca was joining our classes just from her bed just from her bed, she'd log in from her bed, the curtains would be closed. She'd be lying with her face away from the window in a kind of semi-darkened state. And it was just to keep her company. And then at some point, I really distinctly remember you made it to a sitting up position in your bed. And then the big moment was when you made it onto the living room floor with your mat (laughs) and your things, and you made it into a different room of the house. So. Rebecca, I want you to share your story with everyone today because it's so, it's kind of beautiful because you've really done it with grace. And, um, you know, you haven't actually, in all of the kind of watching of you and talking with you and observing you, you haven't been on this kind of panicked, anxiety-driven sort of journey. You've taken it really gently. Um, So I'm going to introduce everyone to the amazing Rebecca Aston Hartbachire. And... um, why don't you tell us a little bit about when it started so that everyone can get a sense of, okay, well, what story is she sharing? Is it like mine or is it very different? So take us back if you can. Okay. Thank you. It's lovely to be here with you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. My journey started in April, 2020. Um, it kind of started before that, like many people I discovered later on, in my kind of long COVID journey that actually I was a lot like many others in that I think things started for me before I actually got COVID. But for now, I'll I'll talk about what happened in April, 2020, which was I woke up on the 17th of April in the middle of the night and I thought, oh, I didn't feel very good. And I had this kind of very odd burning sensation on the top of my head like an awful awful headache like nothing I've ever experienced and I thought wow this doesn't feel very good and I remember it not being good because I woke up my husband to say can you just sit with me for a minute because I really don't feel very well and I I feel like something is very wrong Mm -hmm. and he sort of stayed awake for about 10 minutes or so and was like oh you'll be okay and you know and I think I took a cup of paracetamol yeah go (laughs) just My husband gets up at 5.30 every morning for work, bless him. So <laughs> he was yeah. like, yeah, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. He probably just thought it was one of my normal kind of hormonal headaches or something. Um, but yeah, I think the next morning I realised still, I think, I think I managed to get back to sleep, but the next morning I remember thinking, gosh, I, yeah, I don't feel great. And I had the kind of very common two, three week initial period of feeling quite unwell, quite kind of fluey. I wasn't, I didn't kind of think straight away, oh, I've got COVID because I didn't have a cough. Mm. And I'm trying to remember some of those classic symptoms that people were talking about in those very early days. And I thought, well, I don't have a cough. And I, you know, and I don't, I don't think I, I can't remember if I had a runny nose or not. Anyway, I, I, I didn't feel very well at all for two or three weeks. And then I sort of thought, right, come on, pull yourself together. I'm starting to feel a bit better here, surely. You know, I think I'm starting to turn a little bit of a corner and I started to try and do things like take the dog for a walk and I remember trying to walk around the block and thinking oh my god what what's wrong with me why can't I just walk around the block and I was doing it I was doing it but I was really pushing 
through mm -hmm. to, in, to you know to be able to do kind of normal things I was trying to hang up washing in the garden and I was exhausted and I remember sitting in a chair in the garden thinking I've got to try and move and I remember trying to do some stretches and a little bit of yoga just sitting in a chair but I was just exhausted um and the next sort of part that I remember was a couple of months down the line where it took a turn and I the the brutal and very debilitating fatigue kicked in and that was when I kind of thought oh dear I think maybe there's something more to this and I've got some kind of post viral illness I don't some of it's so foggy some of it my recollection of it is a little bit vague I think just because I was so poorly and it's nearly it was four years ago now um I can't remember at what point I contacted my GP um I can't remember the first time I really I ended up in A&E I do know at about three or four three months down the line or so I do remember my husband being home from work maybe it was the first lockdown again I, I'm not quite sure but I remember saying to him I really really don't feel well my breathing had, at this point my breathing had started to be really bad so I was breathless I was very very achy every single day like I couldn't believe how much my body ached particularly in my arms um mm. I couldn't control my body temperature I had these symptoms and a low grade fever for about seven months, kind of on and off. I just couldn't control my body temperature. I couldn't walk to the end of the road. I couldn't stand up for very long. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't have conversations on the telephone. My hair started to fall out a little bit when my husband would very kindly try to get me to the bath and literally bathe me and have to wash me and wash my hair for me. And I remember him kind of making out like there was not that much hair coming out of my head. <laughs> I was like, oh, I know that one. that's okay. <laughs> What's going on? Um, I think I was getting rashes and all kinds. I mean, it, the list goes on and on. It was, yeah. you know, <laughs> but, but the, the most debilitating thing was probably the fatigue. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That was what made things really, really difficult. And I think I remember one day my husband being home with me and I said to him, I can't, I, I don't think I could get from the sofa to the bathroom alone. I just was so breathless and feeling so terrible. And I think we rang 111 and they said, we're going to send some paramedics out because we can hear that you're breathless. And I think that was the day they came and they said, gosh, you know, you, you seem very poorly. Um, I think they did something like an ECG and something was a little bit amiss. And they said, we're going to take you in, at which point I'm now terrified. You're panicking. Yeah, yeah. Panicking because I'm thinking, you know, we've all been watching the news and we've seen these, yeah. you know, these big hospitals being set up and all this terrifying information. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm now in the back of an ambulance. What's going to happen to me? Right. You're taking me to the war zone. <laughs> yes. And I really was quite scared. I think I was in tears in the back of the ambulance and... Yeah, it was not a pleasant feeling. My husband stayed home with my son because I didn't, you know, I didn't want him to see that. And He wasn't allowed in with you. I no. know when I went in, no one was allowed with me. Yes, no, 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 you're right. Yeah, of course. No, so no one could come with me. Anyway. No. Um, I did a, a one-night stint, thank God. I did a one-night stint and it was, you know, the usual kind of story of, well, we can't really see anything terribly wrong we are sure you've had covid and yeah. you are taking some time to recover you just need to rest and you'll probably feel better soon just go home and rest you'll be okay um and from that point on there were a series of trips to a and e i think a couple of times with um some severe chest pains and nearly passing out and yeah just some some, some odd stuff went on yeah. i then I don't know if I could say I was starting to get better, but I, you know, I was, I was around the seven, eight month mark. I remember that was probably my lowest point. I think at about eight months was my lowest point when I remember saying to my husband, I just don't want to wake up tomorrow. I can't do this. I cannot do this. How is it physically possible for somebody to feel this ill every day for this long? How can I ache like this? Why can't I control my body temperature? By this point, I was definitely in touch with a GP. Um, the burning, headachey thing was awful as well. It was pretty much every other day. 
Um, I do remember in those early days, I did get sent for an MRI brain scan. It didn't reveal anything at all, really. Um, and I did have a very supportive GP. In that sense, I was lucky. He was very willing to send me for blood tests. He was very willing to help in any way that he could. But of course, he couldn't really help me because he had no clue. You know, he was in the dark as much as me, I think, other than having a little bit of knowledge about post-viral illness. Um, he was very sweet. I would call and I would, you know, we'd have updates and I'd be in tears and I'd say, I just don't know what to do. You know, how can I be this poorly for this long? This is not normal. What's happening to me? <laughs> and, you know, he was he was lovely, but he he wasn't a huge amount of help to me because he just didn't know. It wasn't it wasn't his fault. Um, I then got COVID again just after Christmas and my husband got COVID from work. And he was ill over Christmas in bed for 10 days, really quite poorly. And although he kind of isolated himself in, in a spare room, somehow we still, I think his mum was staying with us at this point. I was very, very fortunate, I must just say, that my mother-in-law um, was a carer. And she lived with us occasionally when she wasn't doing her live-in care work. And so she was very sweet and I was in such a bad way that actually she stopped caring for a while and came to stay with us and took very lovely care of me. And I was extremely grateful to have that help because my husband had to get back to work. You know, and I couldn't really sometimes I found it difficult to get up and down the stairs on my own. So, you know, she was here. She was helping. She took over the whole kind of cooking, housework, take care of everyone situation, which was fantastic. And I was very lucky. Um but yeah, so I got COVID, I think it was in January. And what that, happened? What happened this time round? Yeah, that knocked me pretty hard, I must say, because at this point I'm still pretty poorly. I think okay. I had I think I was just starting to be able to kind of regulate my temperature and things, but it it it, it knocked me. I remember I, I recently looked back at some pictures of around that time. God, I looked awful. I mean, I really looked awful. I'd lost a lot of weight. Um the second time was a bit different. I had some different symptoms. I think I lost my sense of smell just for a few days, taste. Um, don't remember much else about it. Fatigue kicked in hard again. You know, the second time was, it wasn't great for me. Um, but I think it wasn't too long after that that I found you. Mm -hmm. I think it was a little while, perhaps a, a few weeks, a couple of months afterwards that I was kind of looking around you know, as you do, I'd kind of stopped calling the doctor every couple of weeks because I was, you know, not, there was not really much to say about it. So I started to do a little bit of my own research, you know, are there other people out there that are feeling like this? So, you know, and then I think long COVID started to become a bit of a thing. Yeah. And yeah, that was when I found somewhere on Facebook, I found you. <laughs> and that was quite a turning point for me to realize that I was not alone, yeah. that I wasn't the only very poorly person um, because all of those things before that went through my head, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I, why am I so weak? Why can't I just shake this off? You know, what other people, obviously there were people around me. My husband was poorly for 10 days, bang, back to work. Yeah. His, you know, his mum was nearly 70. She was ill for a couple of weeks, bang, fine again. And I was like, what? Yeah. I don't I not understand. How could, why me? What's, <laughs> what's happening? So it was a, you know, it was a huge relief to find that I wasn't the only person and it wasn't something to do with me or my personality that was wrong or weak or, you know, I, I, I did struggle with that quite a bit, but yeah, it was, it was good to find people, you know, in, in the same space. So you found the Facebook group and then you joined the Rest Repair program, didn't you? And yeah. uh, we'd probably been up and running for about eight months by then. And there was a nice community of people in there who, you know, many of whom have now left because they're totally better and <laughs> getting on with lives. Um, and one of the things that has been really interesting for me about your journey is that at some point, I think you made a decision to stop trying to find the silver bullet, didn't you? Yeah. You stopped reading yeah. the research. You stopped trying to take the next fashionable supplement. You stopped trying things out and you were like, I'm just yeah. going to do this work with my body and work on my mindset and just look after myself. 
So yeah. tell me what point that became your kind of protocol. I mean, I think initially, the truth is, it wasn't that I was kind of going, oh, I'm just going to do this whole big holistic approach. You know, to be fair, in the beginning, I simply didn't have the energy or the capacity yeah. to research, to email people, to ring doctors, to, I do, I did have some, I do you know, I don't even know who it was. I can't remember if it was a cardiologist. I, in the in the early part of 2021, I did have some kind of consultant appointment on the phone and he was terribly empathetic and very lovely, but again, no real answers. And I remember ending that conversation and I was in floods of tears. And I think it was that point that I just thought, right, yeah, they don't know what's wrong. Mm. I was trying very much to pay attention to the message that you were sharing about rest, about you know, really looking after myself, giving myself time and space. And I just thought, right, well, I'm just going to dedicate myself to trying this. Mm. And I don't mm. think I wasn't at some huge point of acceptance then. I just didn't really know what else to do. I thought, well, this is yeah. this is what I have to try. There's literally yeah. no answers out there. And I didn't have the capacity to keep looking. I know other people perhaps had a bit more energy to do that. But I genuinely, I was so badly fatigued. I just simply didn't have the energy so I, you know, I just stopped because I thought that that's yeah. using up, you know, resources that I just don't have right now. Absolutely. And I think it helped that I had someone here helping to look after me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that might be when I found my therapist around that point. I realised that I was struggling, struggling terribly with my mental health. You know, that that mm -hmm. eight month mark w w was scary for me. I was really quite worried about my thought process and it wasn't I didn't want to kill myself or I just didn't want to wake up and feel like that anymore to, you know feel that poorly and so I realized that I needed to work on my mental health well done and I think it was at that point that I started realizing that in the run-up to getting COVID I had a history of chronic laryngitis okay <laughs> Um, I was getting severe laryngitis every few months. I was a preschool teacher and a swimming teacher. So as a swimming Ish. teacher, I worked in a very hot and humid environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, best place to pick up a bug, swimming pool, you know, that, that hot, humid space, mm -hmm. um, lots and lots of children. <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. like 60 kids a day with snotty noses and, you know, so um, laryngitis was my thing. Um, yeah. I was very good at getting laryngitis um, every few months. And at one point, I remember having it for six weeks. And I've not, I've not, I'm not the sort of person, I'm not one of these kind of real overachievers, go, 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 go. But I'm very conscientious about my work. And so yeah. I would push through because mm -hmm. I didn't want to let them down. I would literally, I mean, thankfully, swim teaching is a lot of demonstration. So I would literally have no voice and just do demonstrations with my arms, you know, as to what I wanted my kids to do. Um, and it wasn't very pleasant. And so I, I just had that, you know, that kind of culture of pushing through when you're poorly. Because this is this is what I'm dealing with. I have to go to work. I'll just deal with it the best way I can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I had a term time job. They were relying on me. I was a supervisor as well. So I just didn't want to let anybody down, that usual thing. So I'd have a couple of days off. But when it starts getting to five or six weeks... It was like, I can't, I can't be off for five weeks. I'm just going to have to push through, you know. Right. And right. Actually, at the end of 2019, so just before the whole pandemic started, I was diagnosed with walking pneumonia. Wow. I saw some funny particles on my lungs. And I had, I think I remember having three lots of chest x-rays in the end. And I was diagnosed with walking pneumonia. And I knew that I wasn't feeling myself. But I think by this point, I'd gotten so used to feeling rubbish that I just, that was what I was kind of used to. I just thought, oh, I'm tired. I'm a mum. I'm working. It's normal. But clearly, <laughs> it wasn't really normal. Right. Um, so, so let me just stop you a second. Was this the first time in your life that you've had kind of a, a run of illness going on for you? Or has that been something from your history as well? Yeah, a little bit from my history, to be honest. Yeah. I've had phases, cycles in my life where there, there was a point where I, in my early 20s, where I was getting lots of urinary tract infections. Um, mm. 
I haven't pursued this. I'm almost sure I have MCAS. I've always yeah. had sort of allergy type symptoms. I have. Can I just stop you there? Some of the most extreme visible symptoms that I've seen on any of our students have been your facial swellings that have occurred yeah. that have been an extraordinary, you know, allergic response to something that you've never really found out what it was, right? Yeah. Well, but I mean, the whole I know when side of your face came up. Goodness. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the next bit of the story, really. The whole, that was my reaction that first started. I mean, I was getting rashes. I've always been a bit of an allergic -y type person. I've never had sort of an EpiPen or anything like that, but I do have a history of, you know, issues. I have a history of IBS, but I'm very, also through ther therapy, I'm very aware that a lot of that was due, I think, to childhood trauma. Okay. Um, I did have a very difficult time as a child and particularly as a teen. Um, my mother was an alcoholic and I had a, you know, a pretty tough time with all of that. Um, and yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> so let me just say for clarity here, you know, I think it's really great that you're bringing this up because there is so much research out there now that pinpoints, you know, if you have acute childhood experiences, ACEs, as they are called in the ACEs mm -hmm. study, you are much more likely not 100% guaranteed, but much more likely to go on to develop in later life and actually in childhood for, for many, um, a compromised immune system, which can lead to straight away gut issues, uh, yeah. allergy issues, chronic illness, chronic inflammation later on in life. So, you know, more and more people, you know, once we talk about this in the work that we do in the groups and in the live sessions, more and more people are putting that piece of the puzzle in and going, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's been some stuff in my past. Yes, I may have had some health issues as an adult, maybe more than other people around me, but so these things can definitely be linked to some people's stories. Now it's not for, it's not this the, the way in for everybody, but for many, many people, a very, very reactionary body is is one that has necessary sometimes in the past been dealing with acute childhood experiences, which have paved the way to this point in their health journey. So, yeah, great. Yeah. So tell me, so tell me about at what point in the journey did all of that really start to kick in? Because I don't know, I don't remember. I just remember yeah. your pictures. She would share these pictures in the Facebook group, and we'd all just be kind of, what the heck? <laughs> what's going on with Rebecca <laughs> yeah so I think I mean that was I you know I started the therapy around the time that I found you and I started making connections to the past and to childhood things and I that was kind of when I knew that if I was going to get better I was going to have to go on a bit of a holistic journey that this yeah. was going to, have to be a whole kind of mind body and I thought gosh I think I also just want to quickly say that I did struggle with some quite I've had periods of very severe anxiety in my adult life so I also am aware that I had put my body under a huge amount of stress at times with fight or flight and I mean it would last I'm not talking about panic attacks I'm talking about anxiety that would last for days um I never wanted to have medication um for lots of reasons um my mum managed to get sober so for the second half of our relationship my mum was sober for 20 years before she passed away and she was um she was very she in, in rehab she learned a lot about the holistic approach about my body about child she had her own childhood trauma so I learned a lot of fantastic and valuable lessons from my mum and I suddenly started realizing that the things that she had spoken about were making sense to me so I you know I I realized what I kind of needed to do and what was going on and I knew the reason I would get I would get more anxious when I was anxious because I knew how bad it was for my body to be in that fight or flight state but I just got stuck in this awful cycle um so anyway I, I I started to work with a therapist I was doing the work with RRR and I just started to feel a bit safer a bit better um you know I I, I think I, I I told you on the retreat that I <laughs> I enjoyed the classes and the connections so much that when they would end I would cry 
because I knew that I'd have to spend the rest of the day getting through and managing things on my own. Because at this point, I think my mum-in-law started to go back to caring. My husband was at work, my son was at school. And there were quite long days alone with, you know, because I was pretty much still relatively housebound, I think, at that point. And so I would cry when you would go, and I'm going to leave you here, goodbye. And I'd go, oh, don't leave me. <laughs> oh, God, it was awful. But, but you know, but it was, but, but then it made me look forward. It gave me structure. It gave me something to look forward to, a bit of a purpose again, you know. Um, we then got into this phase, didn't we, I think, sometime in 21, where we started to vaccinate. Yeah. yeah. Um, my first two vaccines were okay. I think they caused me some symptoms and some quite bad fatigue. Um, and I was just plodding along. There was a period where I was just kind of at your kind of what we would say, what, level 0.51 for a very long time. I was doing the stuff mm -hmm. from bed. Um, and then, yeah, there was quite a long period. I, I think maybe about a year. A year yeah. of just let me let me just explain what Rebecca means here. So in the rest repair program, we we have a, a level, a level structure. Um and it's all self-assessed. You're in charge of what level you're at, and people can do, you know, people can move up and down between the levels according to how they feel on the day. Um, so it's not graded exercise in any way, shape, or form. It is just kind of where am I today? At what level should I work? But the thing that we insist is if you're new, you come in at level zero and you just watch and you don't try things out because we know the human condition is to come in and try hard. <laughs> so it's about relearning how to approach any kind of class or any kind of course program, instruction, you know, movement, whatever. And just to come to come into a place where you're really underachieving <laughs> and literally, you know, getting yourself to the point where you're bored. That's a very good sign. When you're very ill, you're not bored. You're in survival mode. When you experience boredom, that's a really good sign that you could perhaps do a little bit more. So Rebecca came in in that just in that kind of limbo land between I'm in survival mode, but I'm also beginning to get a little bit bored. <laughs> so you could start to do a tiny bit more after a period of time, which was great. Yeah, and we saw that we saw that moment with you and it was beautiful. Yeah. So that first year I kind of with you, I stayed at that kind of, you know, that kind of low level. And I kept listening every time to what you would say about let's don't push and don't you don't need to be looking at people that are doing more than you and just concentrate on what you're able to do. Um, and that was always really helpful to me. I always took that on board. Um, and I started, I think I felt like I was starting to see obviously green shoots and the therapy was really, really helpful. Um, and then I had the booster. And I know that the whole vaccine thing is controversial. Um, but my experience is that I went and had my booster because I was trying to do the right thing because I was terrified of getting COVID again and it being worse or, you know. Um, so I kind of did the what I thought was the right thing and I went off and had the booster. And seven hours after that booster, I was eating dinner and I thought I'd just bitten my lip. I thought, oh, did I bite my lip? But I didn't feel like I'd bitten it. And I thought, my lip's all puffy. And within half an hour, my bottom lip had was hugely swollen the side of my face started to swell my throat started to feel funny and it was happening quite rapidly and I took an antihistamine but it was one of those ones that you take like one a day it wasn't anything strong or <laughs> it was nowhere near enough it kept going and I said to my husband okay this is not looking good and I've had the vaccine let's go to hospital again <laughs> so yeah. off we went um at this point, I am not feeling good again. I am very anxious. And so I just didn't have the energy to argue back when in A&E, despite it being seven hours since I'd had that vaccine, they said, we don't think this is a reaction to the vaccine because if it was going to be a reaction, it would have happened immediately. And so I just remember thinking, I just thought, oh, okay, well, and I just think I had terrible fatigue by this point because as lots of us know now that when you get very stressed and you get emotional it you know it, Shut the, down. Yeah, yeah, the yeah 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 and I was exhausted um I think when I went in they pumped me full of you know they saw straight away that something was 
you know, it was out of control. And I think, I can't really remember, I think I got pumped full of steroids and God knows what. And I just took it because I'm, you know, I was scared, my throat was closing. Um, and I just took whatever they gave me. But I then was left to sit in A&E for about six hours. So this is now at about four in the morning. I'm exhausted. I'm tearful. I'm all by myself. You know, I don't think we were allowed people with us still again at this point. Um, I can't really remember, but I was definitely alone. Um, and yeah, so when I finally actually got to see a doctor, you know, they said to me, knock on the door. If, it, if anything feels worse or it's changing, knock on the door and we'll see you. But for now, take a seat. We'll see you when we can. And I think I was there for most of the night. And by the time I saw someone, their reaction was this, you know, this, we don't think this is a vaccine response. I mean, I, I don't know to this day what all that was about. I mean, it seems shocking to me and it's quite upsetting when I think about it now. It's one of the hardest things to think back on so I'm going to move on from it but yeah it was it was hard um so about, tell us tell us what happened let's let's fast yeah. forward like three months yeah. so how long did it take you to pull out of that res that response well it wasn't oddly it's so it wasn't so much a fatigue kind of response the 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 severe response I continued to have from that was terrible terrible digestive issues something happened so before this I know lots of people suffered with um, digestive issues with long COVID. I, I hadn't. It hadn't been an issue for me. So that started for you. Oh, wow. It was probably one of my worst symptoms overall in the end um, because it was very difficult to eat anything. I then mm -hmm. had to start going on quite restrictive diets, try this, try that. I think this is the point where I got a nutritionist involved and said, like, help me. I can't eat mm -hmm. anything. I flat. I can't. What do I do? Um, and we started working a little bit on histamine issues and inflammation, right. of course. And I just kept getting these random swellings and we weren't sure what it was, uh, but I think we sort of agreed it was some kind of histamine response. Mm -hmm. um, again, I was a little bit reluctant though to go hard on completely excluding too much stuff. So I just sort of did a general kind of watch your gluten, watch your dairy caffeine alcohol which kind of wasn't doing much of that anyway um and I think that took me another eight months year to really start to calm down um I again obviously because of that reaction got sent to an immunologist who said please don't touch the vaccine again and we are seeing these responses to the vaccine it was the vaccine that caused that response it it must have been yeah um, yep. They suggested that I maybe go and get checked out for MCAS. That's another side story. That that was almost impossible to get sorted. I just kept getting bounced from one place to another. And in the end, I just went, oh, God, leave it. <laughs> well, MCAS is a really difficult thing to get a diagnosis for. And it's not talked about enough, particularly. It's certainly not taught at medical school. So, you know, lots of doctors are kind of, I need to look this up. I don't don't even know what you're talking about so wow okay I mean just listening to your symptoms it's it's very M Cassie in its kind yeah. of type so I think yeah. that's exactly the route that you've gone down now isn't it that's yeah. part of my systemic response that's what's going on for me and I'm going to treat it accordingly yeah yeah so, so tell us so kind of fast forward us a bit further because I don't know where we are at this point are we 21 or 22 now I think now we're 22 yeah, yeah. we're at least 22 if not into 23 I think yeah. now because it, it was a good eight months to a year of me having to continue to focus on the classes yeah. Yeah. continue very much on my digestion and my diet um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the same time I was doing a lot of work on my mental health and at this point I'm starting to realize that I need to maybe look at changing some of the things that I'm doing. So one of those being that it was probably not a good idea for me to go back to the swim teaching for the foreseeable because I had been very poorly for two, three, maybe even four years before this all happened. And I started making that connection potentially with that environment, with chlorine. It was quite a stressful job being a supervisor there. Um, slightly toxic workplace and I don't mean toxic chlorine I mean unfortunately the way that the the culture of the environment of, yes. of where you were working yeah. and I had been sweeping that under the carpet for quite some time um 
it was a term time job it paid very well it worked mm -hmm. around my son so I so kind of kept making it stuck easy. it out yeah. yeah I stuck it out and so I started to make the connection that perhaps I needed to start thinking about doing something different and obviously one of the hardest parts of the journey is the whole kind of you know loss of job loss of purpose mm -hmm. guilt shame all that comes with that I had um, conversations with people because I had a history of anxiety it was extremely frustrating for people to keep mentioning anxiety to me that perhaps I was just anxious and perhaps if I just got myself back to work or if I just kept busy I would feel better surely I would just feel better like everybody else you know that, what's you know, wrong with you that you yeah. can't do this most people recover so it took a lot I'm really proud of the fact that I was able to kind of that was when I started to really learn about setting boundaries as well. I need to set boundaries for myself with some of these people that just don't get it. I used to get so angry and frustrated and upset. And through the conversations we would have, you know, on a Thursday after the ORR class, we'd have those chats. And I was listening to what people were saying and I was taking everything on board. And I knew that I had to separate myself from some of my relationships. And I started to understand so probably in 23 was when I started to understand the mind body connection as well I started to realize that at this point some of my symptoms were becoming quite kind of fear related I would get myself in a bit of a cycle of being very work tough I was so scared of the fatigue so scared of PM you know that I would limit I was starting to really limit myself and, and that was that was a difficult phase too, because I was starting to feel better. I was moving up, you know, in, in the classes and I was kind of thinking, right, okay, you know, I'm, I'm you know, things are changing, I'm feeling better, but there was definitely such a lot of fear, you know. And what, we know what we know is fear stokes the bonfire of this reaction internally. Yeah. So where there's fear there is more symptom where there's fear there's you know uh, someone who's just really going to struggle to get through that wall onto the other side and of course fear is inevitable because it's terrifying yeah. so that's a really big piece of work that often people find hard, the hardest thing to do how do I stop being afraid of my body and what it's doing yeah and especially because you know I'm listening to you and I'm thinking well so much of the work that we do in the rest repair program is in the safety of your home. So people sometimes go, right, well, I'm at level three here and I can lift some little weights and I can do a little bit of this and I can stand up and do a bit of yoga. But actually, as soon as I leave the house, the fear kicks in and the body goes onto high alert. And then it goes, no, 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 no. We're not safe out here. We've got to shut you down. Get back in the house. <laughs> Stay in the house. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. Don't leave. Which yeah. is really, really compromising. I definitely started to recognize that. And I started, I had the capacity now to start to kind of listen to audio books and to read. And so I read some of the classics that people have shared. Is it um, Alan Gordon? And, you know, the, and I started understanding about somatic tracking and I started to try and do a bit of work on that. Still doing lots of therapy. I must say. Can I, must I just say the name of the book? So, oh, yeah. There's, there's, um, so if you're listening to this, there is some feedback on Rebecca's microphone, but just bear with us. I'm so sorry. Um, the book that Rebecca is mentioning here is The Way Out by Dr. Alan Gordon. So somatic tracking, he talks about it. It's a, it's a, it's a process to basically train the brain out of that fear mode. The brain is a fabulous thing for keeping us safe. Okay, as soon as something happens, it makes a link. It says, oh, that was bad. So therefore, I'm going to make sure we don't expose ourselves to that again so what can happen is in that vulnerable stage of coming out of illness you might go and do a walk that's a little bit too strong and the brain goes oh no that's too much that was too much you're tired and we don't want to get tired so the association with doing a walk becomes really linked into the brain's processes so that when we even think about doing a walk again it's like oh no 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 you can't do a walk so it's it's a brilliant we have a brilliant brain it's always working to keep us safe uh, but it will also become part of the problem. We do need to do think really gentle things like somatic tracking, where we come into a state of signaling internally that it's okay, the body is safe. And I'm not saying push through and go and go for a big run. I'm just saying start to link 
doing gentle, joyful things as being safe things rather than things that cause you threat. So I love that you're you're talking about that because it's such an important piece of this whole thing. And it, it's a it's a piece of the recovery that you have to do, especially yeah. if you've been ill for a long time. You have to get the brain to come out of fear and panic and, and keeping you safe mode. I think, like, well. I think equally there is a bit of a, not a time and a place, but a, a time in your recovery where you are maybe more ready to accept that. I think earlier I just didn't have the capacity and I didn't really understand it. And, and when I would see people recovering and saying, oh, well, I did this and, you know, my body and I would think, oh my God, shut up. I can't, what are you talking about? I cannot think my way out of this. I've tried, but yeah. <laughs> but actually it was, it's more complex than that. And so it's I- And you're absolutely right. There is a time, there is a time and you'll, you'll be getting more of those windows of, I'm having a few more good days. And then the bad days still come. That's a really good sign that you're ready to tackle that piece. But, you know, listening to your story and hearing your reaction to the booster. No, you're you're not going to you're not going to train yourself out of that one overnight. That one needs to be managed from a, a th literally a 360 perspective, which you did brilliantly. And yeah. then you get to the point again where you're going. Now I know that the fear is keeping me stuck. Yeah. And I want to change that. I did become very aware of that feeling. I noticed, you know, I would be getting ready to drive somewhere and I would start to feel tired and my heart rate would go up. And I mean, I, I've, I've sort of failed to mention some of the things that I clearly had, but because I just didn't have the energy to go out and, you know, chase doctors. And I definitely think I had dysautonomia. I think I had POTS. Um, <laughs> just from watching the other videos that you've done, I was kind of like, oh, I was having that. Oh, I was having that. And it's interesting. I think it's important to say, um, and it's not to say that this is the route for everyone. And also, equally, we know so much more now than we did yes. when we were really poorly. So I'm not saying really, don't, don't go out and, and get that help. I'm not saying that mm. at all. But what I find interesting is that without any kind of antihistamines, without any kind of beta blockers or any medication at all, I have healed. Yeah. I, I have managed to heal. And I just think that that is... Let me just, <laughs> let me just re clarify that. So this comment isn't lost. You didn't take antihistamines despite having MCAS, which I'm still a bit like, <laughs> no. I don't understand why. But anyway, she chose not to. And here she's saying, I'm grand. Um, she didn't take beta blockers for the heart thing. She didn't go down the medication route. This woman has not gone down the medication route. She's chosen not to. For whatever reason, we don't even need to unpack that. And it's still, your recovery has still happened. Yes. Yeah. I just, th I think it is important to note that. And I know that's not the way for everybody. And I have my own reasons for not yeah. wanting to take medications necessarily, you know, past bad experiences, um, wow. you know, a little bit of health anxiety. I also have a history of blood clotting and mini stroke. So sometimes medications for me can be a little bit complicated. And so, you know, but the point being that I didn't have the energy or the capacity in the beginning to, and also nobody knew really what was wrong. And I now know that I had a whole host of these things going on, but it just goes to show that when you really, really do take care of yourself. And I decided that my recovery was going to win. And when I was so upset about losing my job and, you know, at about two years in, I thought, right, my job, is recovery that's my job yeah. and it was a full-time job that's the truth it was a roller coaster the amount of times that I had to dig deep mentally to pick myself up each time there was a dip or a crash or whatever you want to call it and things like that I started to change my language having listened to Alan Gordon having joined the classes literally week in and week out I was trying to take on board of those messages as I started to feel better I think a big turning point for me there were a couple of really big things that helped one of them I must mention was that I so before it became a thing in RRR that you could find a recovery buddy yeah. um, yeah. I connected with somebody through the group um, I think it was over a love of Strictly Come Dancing <laughs> she made a right. comment I made a comment we bonded and I found this incredible incredible friendship with mm -hmm. um someone in the group and that was an absolute game changer 
because we still to this day we message most days so we voice note and we message and having that connection having somebody that completely and utterly understood how difficult this journey was the highs the lows the the mental battle having that person to connect with was it, I, I sometimes say to her like how am I ever going to thank you like I feel like you've literally saved my life and she says well how am I ever going to thank you and we have this competition about who's gonna how are we gonna you know what will we do for each other um but she you know she's been incredible and I think around not long after that we started the whole if you would like to have a recovery buddy and the benefits nice. yeah so let me just let me just make a note on that because I'm sure some people watching will will go I want a recovery buddy <laughs> um so we did have someone who was pairing people and you know we had a massive demand and I don't you know some of those kind of pairings will have worked well and some of them won't I think you know the comp there's a, it's a very complex relationship having a recovery buddy because if you're looking for a recovery support kind of partner and you're not able to offer support to to, in both ways it can be really hard work for one person to be holding someone else's grief whilst also dealing with their own stuff so we realized quite quickly that actually it needed a better kind of protocol and we tend to now encourage people to come back into the Facebook group which is for the rest repair recover program only not the big Facebook group um, and to seek many buddies to, to create groups and actually you know one of the things that we then did well, actually, we've done it for a few years now is set up the Fern program, which it literally brings together a group of people who become dedicated buddies for each other. And from there, we see amazing things uh, sort of happening and, you know, literally people getting together from all over the world now kind of going, well, I'm going to meet my Fern group. So actually, we know it's important to find someone to be your your kind of cheerleader, your your empathy, your your shoulder to kind of cry and that really gets it. And it's not the easiest thing. So I want to really praise the relationship. Let's, what's her name? Rachel. I want to praise you and Rachel here because, you know, you're one of the friendships that has really, really, really survived and thrived in this difficult time without either of you leaning on each other too much and there being this incredible, respectful friendship that has grown. That hats off to you. Well done. Amazing. Yes. We did have a really good understanding you know we would say if you're too tired so we would message and I'd say if you're too tired you do not need to respond to me today and sometimes she wouldn't and sometimes I wouldn't and we were really respectful and that's why it worked there were kind of boundaries in place we had this kind of agreement from the off you know and I just think I was very fortunate to find somebody so lovely who had that same kind of want from it as I did you know it was very much we, we both wanted to get better we were both determined to get better it wasn't about constant complaining and symptoms it was about okay so I'm having a tough day what can I do to help you or you're having a tough day what can I do I'm having a tough day can you help me out of this funk you know and we we would laugh I mean I don't know how many times I've cried on the phone to her or but equally we have laughed so much. I mean, there has been so much laughter and joy in that relationship, I, I cannot tell you. Um, we've met a few times, that's always been, our, our families have become friends, her wife is amazing. They're, they're like aunties to my son now. <laughs> my husband loves them, you know, and I, I, I do just want to say as well that I was, I've been really lucky in the overall, I've had really good support, which has been important. My husband has been, incredible I don't know that I would have had the same kind of patience and dedication as he has had I I just I don't think I'm as patient as he is but and as much as that was incredible and I had good family support having Rachel was different because it was someone who really really got it and understood so that was that's been a really huge part of my recovery and I think it's we've encouraged each other to get better you know to find ways of coping and she's also done a very kind of more holistic approach um I don't I, I I don't even know if she ever bothered to speak to her GP after about the first six months and she's at the four year mark too so <laughs> we both just kind of went well, let's just let's find other ways to to get better right. um, the thing that I want to say here is I really love you know I hear you talk about health anxiety I hear you talk about your acute childhood experiences and I also hear you talk about the fact that 
you know that they were things that were going to hold you back and that you needed to work on them. And one of the things that I see time and time again is people who are very much in their anxiety and unwilling to look ar around the edges of it to see that there is another space that's worth working to get to that, that you know that this there isn't anything outside of the health anxiety and actually that is probably one of the the most stuck places that I see people in um you know and I hope anyone listening to this that's got health anxiety that's you know really really caught up in the I'm never going to get better. Oh my God, if I do that, it will make me sick. Oh, I can't go there. You know, that terrible, terrible, terrible kind of internal dialogue constantly creating fear within the body. There is another way of thinking. You will need help, you know, because the anxiety is there for a genuine reason. The brain has gone, that was not good. We are going to keep you safe. Anxiety is part of our survival techniques as a human creature. It makes us worry about things in order to prevent them from happening. The thing that becomes the problem is, you know, the thing that's happened to your health has been so consuming. The anxiety serves to shut down your life almost completely, which is an incredibly unhelpful and unhealthy way of being. So if you are watching this, know that, you know, you can get help from whatever reasons, you know, so many people seek help from therapy. If you don't find the right therapist, find a different one, but definitely get someone to help you. Even if you don't have acute childhood experiences or, or a history of trauma, the thing that you're living with this journey, with this health challenge is tough enough. You know, yeah. it's absolutely tough enough. And so to be able to talk to someone in the way that Rebecca is saying, I talked to someone with my recovery buddy, never mind your therapist, mm -hmm. every day and having that space that someone goes, I hear you. And yeah. I know this is hard. That is so, so transformative. Your nervous system then goes, oh, I'm heard. I'm real. These are real things. Well, maybe I can relax a bit. And that begins the process of unstitching some of this fear. Yes. So I really want to acknowledge, you know, all of the different choices that you've made, which have been so helpful to you and how fantastic that you've, you've had the courage, and you know, to go, I'm not going to take drugs. I am going to talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to work on my diet, obviously, you know, for so many people getting gut health is absolutely key to this, but getting your mental health as well is one of the biggest, biggest and most important things. Don't resign yourself into a state of well this is just it don't resign yourself to that I think that's you know once you've once you've kind of given up then you're stuck there and I think you know it's lovely to hear Rebecca's story because we know that she didn't give up she just kept finding new avenues to explore so just tell me I'm aware we're kind of going to be running yeah. out of time tell yeah. me how you are now so we met at the retreat a few weeks ago and yeah. I ran a specific retreat for people who were coming out of this journey and getting back into life and it was very much about checking in with where we were now and giving ourselves permission to let go of some of this stuff some of the upset the trauma the identity of being unwell we kind of let go of it didn't we there was a bit of a ceremony we did at the end yes how are you now especially after going through that process yeah so obviously I mean things are, are, are much much better now I think um I I started to really feel a difference at the end of 20, 2023. So towards the end of 2023, I could just feel a change. Um, I had started to do a bit of voluntary work, um, yes. which, was, which was great for my self-esteem. And I know that everybody is not in the same position as me. Um, I was fortunate in that I didn't have to rush back to work. Um, I started voluntary because I felt like that would take the pressure off. But I just needed somewhere to be I wanted to be able to build up in a slow consistent way without the pressure and if I didn't feel up to it I wouldn't go funnily enough I did that for a year and in that year I think I missed one of my days just one of them and so that was building up those those positive good experiences I can do this I've got this so that was a that was a, a huge turning point for me um obviously the therapy I continued to do the therapy it was still helping um, and I just noticed, I think I just started to notice a real shift at the end of last year. 
um, something felt very different. I just knew that I was starting to really heal. I, the fear was lessening. I could do more and more. Um, and then, of course, I, I came on the retreat, um, which was, you know, I, I nearly didn't. I nearly didn't because I was really nervous, really nervous. You know, I, I, I felt like I'd, I was, I know that I was doing the voluntary work, but I felt like my world had still become quite small. And so mm -hmm. I could tell that I was still quite fearful and I was kind of living in this little safe bubble of things that I know I can do. And this is okay. I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, and I thought, I don't, I don't want to, I need to come out of that bubble again. I need to lessen the fear and, I didn't really know what I was expecting from the retreat. I, I, I must admit, you you did catch us a little bit off guard with some of it. <laughs> but again, completely underestimated the power of being in a space with 15 or so other people that completely and utterly understood what mm -hmm. I had been through, where I had come from, you know, um, into this space of, oh, things are, things are starting to change and I'm getting there and I'm, you know, I would, I would pretty much say I'm at the recovered point. I, that was a difficult, I mean, I've, I've struggled with that for months, you know, at what point do I say I'm recovered? And for me, I think part of that was once I was able to get back to work and my voluntary work has now turned into two days paid work. Yes which is great which is great so there's been a very slow build up to that but yeah the, the power of being in that space with people that have been on the same journey was really quite incredible mm. and I it was it was quite I, I would say it was a bit of a life-changing experience for me there was I, I'd reached a certain level of acceptance anyway about the type of person that I am about my history um you know there were it was yeah, it was it was amazing to share some of the worst parts of being really poorly, you know, some of those challenges. Um, I've forgotten to mention, I just feel this is really important. I've forgotten to mention that at one point I did start to use a wheelchair and I just want to slip that in because I think it's so important to know that using those kinds of aids or asking for help with certain things is okay I do remember when I first got in that wheelchair I thought if I get in this am I ever going to get out I felt like I was giving in but you know and that was one of the biggest challenges for me as well but actually doing that enabled me to spend more time outside spend more time with family and friends which I realized especially from your advice was so important. I needed to be able to be outside with other people and connect and have joy. And that was such a big part of it too. So I think, yeah, I think the retreat helped me to process some of those really challenging times, you know, and there were lots of tears, lots and lots of tears, <laughs> but there was even more laughter. I think if you run yeah. that, anyone listening to this, if Susie runs that again, do it because I just cannot explain just how, I don't know I can't I can't really think of the words it was just fantastic that, that you had the perfect balance of working through things but then bringing joy into it and that balance of processing but then doing something really joyful was just fantastic and it just made such a difference I've made some lovely friendships still messaging at the moment we're still messaging right. and, you know checking in on each other and it was so one of the, one yeah. of the things that I've been really aware of myself you know just from having done the journey from having watched thousands of people do this journey to the journey itself then becomes part of the acute experiences that sit in our nervous systems and I've been really really aware that actually there needs to be a recovery from the journey for those people that are coming up and out for air and what better you know to do it as we know in connection with other people that totally understand and you can kind of go into those deep and quite intense moments transformational moments and then shake it off really quickly because it's like we're instantly met with empathy we're instantly met with understanding no one needs you to explain anything else other than maybe the title that you've given whatever subject you wanted to kind of raise and everyone just goes oh yeah you get it and then bang it's so important for us to be 
you know, especially if we are more prone to this kind of thing, you know, if you have got a system that is a bit more pro-inflammatory, a bit more responsive, a little bit more spicy, we do need to make sure the cupboards, the, the cupboards that we hold all of our stress in are regularly opened out and flushed and washed and dusted. And I think, you know, one of the things I've realized as, as a kind of a host, a program leader is that this experience in itself also needs to be flushed out of our systems and to give it permission to kind of, you know, go with grace and respect and acknowledge what we've learned from it, which is why I wanted to trial that retreat. You know, are there people that, that need this? And I think I came away really clear. Yes. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. And that's exactly what it was. It was letting go of that journey. I needed time to recover and space to let go of everything that I'd been through because it was still weighing me down I still you know today I can sit here and I can talk about what happened and you know those early days and how awful it was and how scary and how anxious I was and I can do it without crumbling emotionally if you'd have asked me to have this conversation with you even maybe three or four months ago I don't know that I could have held myself together in the same way that I can and she I said, knew, said no multiple times, yes. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> like I needed to be ready. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I think that the retreat really helped me to, to, to let go of a lot of that stuff. It also helped me to let go of fear because I, I realised that I wasn't the only one that was a little bit fearful of the future and what, what lies in store and, you know, will I ever experience anything like this again? And, you know, and I, I you don't know this, but... The day after I got home, so let's bear in mind that the last day of the retreat was quite a busy day and I had, yeah. you know, a, a relatively longish, busy drive home on the M25 and it was pouring with rain and it was a bit stressful. And I got home and I had a house full of people because my sister was visiting from Australia with her children and her husband. And I literally, I had no time to land, really. I got home five minutes later, I had a house full of people. The very next day after the retreat, was my sister's last day in the country. And we went into London and we went to see the changing of the guard. We went to lunch on the South Bank. We went to Tower Bridge. I walked further in that day than I have walked in four years with practically zero fear. I had a tiny wobble just before lunch, but I realized that I should have eaten a snack and I should have drunk more. But I ate and I was full of beans and I cannot tell you the confidence boost and the joy that that gave me. And I know it's because I left stuff behind at that retreat. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to leave the fear, especially of physical activity. I wanted to leave that fear behind me. You know, mm -hmm. I am better now. And I wanted to, I needed to believe that. And that retreat gave me the belief that I am much much better I do have to live my life differently at the moment I do still have to pace a little bit I do have afternoon naps because I can right now and I think that there's nothing wrong with that I think that that's okay I think perhaps if I'd done that a little bit before I got COVID I might not have ended up where I did I love that you know it's so beautiful it's so definitive like you know I am getting better I'm I mean, you're, you're you're so much better Bex, you're so much better. I love, I love what you've shared. What an amazing story. Um, you know, everything that you've just talked about is, I, I love it so aligned with all of the things that I've learned and that I know that I need and that I see that other people really, really get changed and, and benefit from. It's the power of connection. The power of connection co-regulates our nervous system, which then helps it to calm. The power of focusing on joy and not fear so good for the system regulates helps us to feel safe and actually it's really difficult to do unless you deliberately switch the focus yeah. which is why you know coming into the work that we do coming into the classes like in yesterday's rest repair class I got everyone to to show up wearing clothes that they would maybe go out and do the things that they love doing that they're not doing right now so we had people in climbing gear we had people in you know dancing wear party out Bits. we had someone in a tent we put a tent up in the house which had, it was just beautiful because it's so important to keep having fun and if you're not having fun 
please do come in and try the rest repair program we have two weeks free you can just come in for two weeks check it out and if we drive you mad and it's all too much then then don't <laughs> you know but try your two weeks and then leave no big deal but you know the classes are all focused on regulating the nervous system in a way that makes you feel connected with other people supported loved you get entertained by some of the classes not all of them you know some of them are very calming and grounding but the rest repair classes in particular we have group chat afterwards and we always have a bit of fun and a bit of banter and some people just have it on in the background literally like the radio because it makes them giggle and that i think is get something like that if it's not our program find something that makes you laugh that reminds you that there's more to it than your symptoms there's more to you than your symptoms you know this is my kind of demand to any listener out there don't sit with the worry by yourself yeah. worrying about it more and more it's not helping you um, can i just say actually yeah, i don't think in the three or so years that i have attended RRR and noticed that I'm still there. I can't quite let go because, <laughs> because of the joy. I don't think there is a single class that went by where I didn't laugh out loud. Even in those early days when I was really poorly, I would smile and have a giggle to myself about something that you'd said or Ross said. Or So I think the it's, it was so important for me to have that, that little inkling of joy when I was really poorly. And even now, I still have to keep coming whenever I can, even if it's on catch up, because I just know that I'm going to laugh and I'm going to feel connected and I'm just going to, I'm going to have that joy. So it is really, it's, it, it was brilliant. It's so important. Wonderful. Oh, Rebecca, well done. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us all. I'm hoping that it's inspirational for lots and lots of people who might be really stuck where you are. Um, guys, if you, make a comment under the YouTube video. You know, we do get to see them and I'm sure Rebecca can have a little look on the channel and check in every now and again. If you want to kind of ask her questions, please do. But just know that it's possible. That's why this interview is, is you know, being captured because it's really important to share these stories. She was a kind of first waiver. She was super sick. The booster did not help. And look at her today talking about recovery it's been slow she's the perfect hair and tortoise <laughs> example it's been slow but she's been steady and she's stuck to a protocol that's worked for her and it has changed her life in many ways for the better now we can say you know you've learned a lot about yourself you've learned about things that you've needed to kind of take out and deal with you've changed the way that you work you've probably got an extraordinary appreciation for life and freedom and love and happiness now and it's so beautiful to hear you talk about all of this with such a positive kind of spin. So, yeah. Rebecca, May I just, yes, I was about to sorry. say Rebecca based in Hertfordshire, but yes, what would I'm you so like? So sorry, I I just feel like I also have to give a quick shout out to some of the. I know we've talked a lot about the rest recovery repair classes, but I've also done a couple of other courses in terms of I did the mindfulness right. with Annie, Annie, I did Annie. The, the compassion course with Annie through yeah. you guys, um, game changers compassion for yourself when you are poorly is a game changer so I just sorry I just have to give a shout out to those other things that you do because they have been an integral part of my recovery and right. I wouldn't be where I am without without any of it but but those were yeah super oh, I love that. well yeah. Annie Annie is our mindfulness teacher on 360's rest repair program and she also runs these amazing courses and we have a new one starting actually so if you're watching this thank you very much Rebecca because uh, there's a little plug for Annie's next course so obviously if you're watching this after May the course has started <laughs> but we do run them regularly so do check out the the website for that 360mindbodysoul.co.uk um, Rebecca Aston Hertfordshire. There we go. I've said it again. Thank you so much for sharing your story. You are truly inspirational and I'm honored that you have given me an hour of your time to share everything that's been going on for you. And I, I, I still see you in class. So I'm not going to say goodbye. So it's been absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everything, Susie. It's been amazing. You're welcome. Thank awesome. you.